Imagine a world without the need for taps, swipes or remote controls. What if you could turn your lights off, switch the kettle on and even send an email all by just using your brain? No, this isn't quite science fiction. I'm here at Imperial College London to find out more about the future of brain computer interface technology. In April, Facebook revealed it has a team of 60 engineers holed up in a secretive lab working on software that will allow people to type using only their thoughts. What if you could type directly from your brain? It sounds impossible, but it's closer than you may realize. And it's just the kind of fluid human computer interface needed for AR. Serial entrepreneur Elon Musk announced his company, Neuralink, are exploring how brain interfaces might alleviate the symptoms of chronic medical conditions. And he has big ideas for the future. As humans compete with artificial intelligence, he hopes his technology will allow us to keep up by uploading and downloading our thoughts. Some high bandwidth interface to the brain I think will be something that uh, helps achieve a symbiosis and between human and machine intelligence. And if that all sounds like the distant future, take a look at this. This woman has motor neurone disease. Researchers at Stanford University surgically implanted tiny silicone sensors onto the surface of her brain. Those sensors pick up on the electrical signals cells send out, translating them into point and click commands. That's what's allowing her to guide the cursor to characters on this keyboard by thinking. Well, you join me here in the lab of Dr. Aldo Faisal, uh, Associate Professor of Neurotechnology uh, here at uh, Imperial College London. We're in the lab with some very exciting projects you're working on here. Explain a bit more about those projects, if you would. Thank you. So we are working on neurotechnology, and that's the combination of neuroscience and technology to help people. And specifically, we're interested in helping people who cannot move anymore, who are paralyzed, for example. And we're developing here human robot interfaces that allows human to gain mastery of their bodies again by putting on wearable robotic technology. This is a robotic glove that helps people whose hand is paralyzed. And so this is for people who, for example, suffered a stroke and are paralyzed and cannot move their fingers okay. anymore. And this glove can close the hand and give them force in their grip. And we're controlling that glove with a pair of goggles okay. and so we call them the, these guys eye trackers which measure the movements and actions of your eyes and so what's happening now so now we have cameras in these glasses that look at your eyes and we have a computer who tries to interpret what you want to do based on what your eyes do and so the simplest way of doing and controlling this glove is basically just to wink okay so if i wink my right eye and that now allows me to tighten the grip round a bottle of water and if I want to release it like you say I wink and there it's going. <laughs> Explain exactly who this could help in the future. So there are many many people actually almost 10 percent of, uh, of most in most countries of the population have some form of movement disorder paralysis in this type of robotic technology can help them to get a grip on their life again. This is what we're seeing now is a confluence of technology from artificial intelligence end and robotics end that help people achieve more with having to put less effort in controlling or operating them. So you just basically controlled a robotic glove with the wink of an eye and we think everything should be as easy and simple to use for people to want to accept that. So the likes of Elon Musk and, and Facebook are getting involved in this technology, that must really mean that there is a, a future in this area. Neurotechnology is really taking off and we'll see neurotechnology not only in the robotics end of things, but also, for example, helping people with memory problems or emotional problems, psychological problems, augment them with technology. For us, the focus is to stay non-invasive so we can help not just paralyzed people, but also consumers for example, people who have to work, say, in deep sea mining or in deep sea drilling, uh, rescue workers, uh, imagine an empowered fireman who can, you know, lift a car up by himself to people who work in, in the military domain. So could we one day, for example, be washing the dishes and, and sending an email at the same time? That would be fantastic if you want that. I find dishwashing very relaxing in itself. <laughs> but. Um, the question is, how much of that do we want to impinge on our lives? So we see that in mobile phones, people get stressed by the overuse of mobile phones, but also it supports and it aids us. And we need to find a way of 
balancing these two things. Of course, Elon Musk said last year that uh, a human suit would eventually become a house cat, essentially, for intelligent robots. I mean, what do you say about that? There's a small chance that may happen, but I'm not particularly concerned about that. I'm much more concerned about whether we use this artificially intelligent and robotic technology for the betterment of humankind, or if we're using that for more nefarious purposes. The major challenge is putting the human in control of the robotics so that it feels part of themselves, doesn't feel alien, that they feel embodied with that. And only if something feels natural to us do we use it in a natural way. Where will we be in, say, five years' time? I think in five years' time we will see a lot of multimodal interfaces. So what we will see is technology that allows you to operate a glove, like we've seen that one, or uh, to control a robot arm to do the movements that you want to do just with a blink of an eye. But I think that domain will be much farther growing than implant-based technology. Over to Japan now, where a team of so-called ultra-technologists are using artificial intelligence to break down the boundaries of tech, art and your senses. Haruka Nuga has been to look at a new, unique dining experience in Tokyo. Chirping birds, blooming flowers, and intricate Japanese dishes. They're all part of a multi-sensory dining experience made to engage all five senses. Sagaya is a steak restaurant in the high-end district of Ginza, and it's collaborated with art collective company Team Lab. Together, they allow customers to eat with their eyes. It's an experience on many levels, uh, for sure. <laughs> We've been uh, uh, playing with our foods, uh, or almost, almost. It's a grown-up version of that, I would say. <laughs> There are a lot of surprises so far, and I'm realizing that it's helping me focus on a lot of different senses. So I'm trying to eat this meal without forgetting what it tastes like. Depending on the movement and number of plates and customers, the projected surroundings react in different ways. Sensors are able to detect the shape of the plates, which then reveal the artwork within each dish, unfolding and connecting to its surrounding areas. If you uh, hand on the tables, sometimes it's, you know, the bird is going to stop on it at your hand. And if you move it very fast, they're going to run away from you. So we're using uh, sensing and we projections, and also uh, we put it in the AI. The AI technology continues to learn from its changing surroundings and the customer's body language, making no two dining experiences the same. This exclusive immersive space only accepts up to eight customers a day, costing 30,000 yen or close to 300 US dollars per person for a 12-course meal. The installation is set to be permanent with plans to change the menu and projection mapping scenery every month, evolving accordingly to the seasons. That's it for this edition of Future Proof. Do join us next time. Goodbye for now.